Is paid media sitting next to fake news? How can you learn more about the author of a news article? FAQ rich results are now limited to just two items. And Google's page experience update is already rolling out. You're listening to News from the Edge for the week of June 21st, 2021 here on Edge of the Web Radio. From the Edge of the Web Studios, here's what we're looking at this week. This is Edge of the Web Radio. I am your host, Morty Oberstein, filling in for Aaron Sparks. Aaron is on vacation. I am also on vacation, but I am still here, but Aaron is not here. That just tells you everything you need to know about me and everything you need to know about Aaron Sparks. Each and every week, we bring you amazing guests to chat about trending digital marketing topics. Each week, we're covering SEO and digital marketing news separate from our weekly interview podcast, getting more news to you even more quickly, even even more quickly. Who wrote this crap? It's even quicker, even quicker. This is the like, this is what happens when I read from a teleprompter. I'm Ron Burgundy. Be sure to check out our recent shows at Edge of the Web Radio. Dot com. Welcome to the Site Strategic Digital Marketing News Desk of Edge of the Web. That's a very long name also. The Site Strategic Digital Marketing News Desk of Edge of the Web. Holy crap. Who wrote this? Joining me this week to take it all on is my favorite person, my BFF from the SEO world. She's also the director of search content at Search Engine Land and SMX. In other words, she's Barry Schwartz's boss. It's Catherine <laughs> Leiden. Hello, uh, welcome. I'm just going to tell you welcome. Welcome to my day, Maury. <laughs> how is your day going? It's going Wait, well so, so far. It's, it's morning here. What time is it there? It's 6.15 in the evening. But my kids are oh, out wow. of the park. So it's nice. great. doesn't matter what time it is. It's great. By the way, you were talking about you're, you're moving soon. And you're yeah, going to be taking a young, young, young child on an airplane. Yeah, so Good hit luck. me up on Twitter and send me your flying with a baby tips. Uh, I'm, I'm asking everyone. <laughs> Mine but were yeah. African blow darts. I'm not going That's... to blow dart my baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you will see how many, how many hours is the flight? Like two, three? Just like two. And hopefully, uh, usually from DC to Atlanta, it's... Um, they they say it's two hours, but sometimes they can get there even faster. So I think they give themselves a little extra time. But yeah, so it's a short flight. I'm just hoping that uh, if she has a complete and utter meltdown, that uh, everyone will give me some grace on the plane. <laughs> yeah. Also, if they if they do give you crap, you know the horrible people. True. Or they probably don't have kids themselves. They definitely don't have kids. Also, the person who invented <laughs> cereal did not have kids. Because what kind of jackass? created a box full of tiny little pieces they could throw on the floor. <laughs> I feel and like so every time I'm going to get really you, angry. Every time I chat with you, we have a conversation about how you have cereal in your couch and on it's your floor. It's everywhere. Your bed. <laughs> it's, and the, the ridiculous thing is I keep buying it, which is insane, right? Why would I keep Maybe buying it? But the it keeps them occupied. Cereal. It's not the inventor of cereal's fault. It sounds like it's your fault. Yeah, but you have to have this because then they complain, like, we're just cereal, father. How, how are you not feeding us with cereal, father? Yeah, like a bad parent. yeah my, my two-year-old says, father, where's the cereal? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, in case you haven't noticed, um, I am not at Wix anymore. I have left Wix. Well, not, uh, not completely. I'm still, on, I'm still consulting for Wix, and I'm on their SEO advisory board, which means I get to give them a hard time about, hey, you should fix this for SEO now. Um, instead of me, instead of being the opposite, Aaron wanted me to drop my new job, my new role, which is very exciting on this show. Yeah, do it. I'm not going to give him the satisfaction. I'm not peer doing pressure, it. peer pressure. Do it, do it. <laughs> Wait, really? I should do it. Yeah, can I do um, it? I'll make the announcement. Yeah, for you me. do it. You can do okay, it. Ladies okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are elated today to announce that Morty Oberstein has accepted a role as the head of communications at Semrush. Semrush, not SEM rush, Semrush. Are you excited, excited that I said that way? I'm, I'm excited you remembered. 
How could I not remember? You said you were we were very internet instrumental. BFFs, internet BFFs remember where their BFFs move in a job. That's true. Thank you for yeah. remembering and be because otherwise I would question our BFF status. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, we should probably do news, right? This is a news podcast. Okay. I suppose. Okay. I mean, um, that was news. That, uh, yeah, that's right. That was news. I mean, I don't know if that counts. Jacob, does that count as news? Yeah, yeah, I just don't have an article ready for it. Oh, but does my bottom half now have my new title? Like, did you do that really quickly in like three seconds? Yeah, oh yeah, I did it. It was there. Did you it really? Was, you missed it because you were reading your screen. Oh, I okay. had it. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. But misspelled and everything because I didn't tell him beforehand. Okay, let's do this. Article okay. number one from Search Engine Land. New research shows Google serves almost half of all ad traffic on fake news sites. New data indicates that unless advertisers are paying very careful attention to their exclusion list, there is a chance that ads could be showing up next to fake news online. Google is serving 48% of all ad traffic on fake news sites, according to a new study from researchers Leah Bozarth and Saren, Karen Saren Budak at the University of Michigan School of Information. This is brought to you by our very own Carolyn Leiden. Now, I, I will fully admit, I checked out the original, re the original research page for this, and it's 12 pages long. And when I saw the 12 pages, I said, I'm not reading this crap. So Carolyn, what does this thing say? Essentially what you summarized before that uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the majority of, uh, not the majority, but like almost half of these fake news sites get, or okay, I'm the way I'm wording it is making it sound untrue. So fake news sites get almost half of their traffic from Google ads. So uh, it's essentially, Google has said that they care about supporting the truth and that they are cracking down on ads to spammy sites and things like that. They had their um, 20, I think their 2020 ad spam report that came out a little bit earlier this year. They talked about the different ways that they're using AI to try to uh, crack down on spam and also, you know, fraudulent ads and other things related to ads. But um, it's, I think it's important because through 2020 and now into 2021, brand safety has sort of been the top of mind. I don't know why I did that, but it has been top of mind for a lot of advertisers. Um, and we, George has done a great job. George Wynn, who is our amazing editor at Search Engine Land, has talked to a bunch of different people and written a couple of different articles about how lots of advertisers care about what their uh, ads show up, like what sites their ads show up on. And it's it's been a topic of conversation when people are like, I don't want my ads to show up on fake news sites or on spammy sites or next to even controversial news topics. So should I have exclusion lists for these specific sites and these specific topics and things like that? So uh, Google says they're trying to make a difference but it, in this area, but it doesn't seem like according to this data that that has either taken effect or is actually making a difference yet. Yikes. There was a whole thing a couple of years ago. The Guardian pulled all of their YouTube apps for pretty much this reason. They weren't comfortable with the videos that their ad, their pre-roll ads were showing up in because they were spammy, horrible videos. And you don't want that for your brand because if the video is crap, or in this case, the site is crap, then you look like crap. Is it just fake news sites or is it also low quality, spammy, clickbaity sites? Yeah, it's, it's both. So there is this... Um, the researchers actually looked, I'm trying to find exactly how many, um, somebody made a list. Okay, so uh, the study uses a list of misleading sites assembled in 2018 by Melissa Zimders. And I think it had over like 600, um, I'm trying to find it now, 600 websites that they consider, you know, spammy or just low quality, not necessarily doing the best job of journalism, not finding all the truth, not finding all the sources, not really digging in. So the study is based on that list of, I want to I want to say it's like over 600. I might be exaggerating. Look at me being <laughs> the person not finding all the news sources now, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, I can't find the exact number, but there are quite a few. Um, I was going to say 603 sites. officially. I feel like 
That maybe isn't true. <laughs> but it we'll might find be. it. Exact number. And then, yeah, and, and you're saying the best way to handle it is just just to make sure your exclusion lists are very very tight. I mean, yeah, I think it's a larger conversation. Like in some of the articles we've published about brand safety, we've chatted with people who are in charge of media for brands and also for individual businesses. And a lot of them were saying, you know, especially if it's like newsworthy or related to a topic, they pay close attention to what's going on and where their um, ads are showing. And saying okay well today there's like weird stuff happening it's like i think we initially talked about it when the um essentially the assault on the capital in the united states a lot of people yeah. were like i don't want my brand you know for like children's clothing showing up next to news stories about how people are being murdered on the steps of the capital sort of thing so um keeping those exclusion lists idea. Yeah, tight. And then also keeping an eye on the news. It's um, other other people have the opinion that if it's a reputable site and it's sort of a news topic that's maybe not one to one with your brand that maybe consider other things than pulling back your ads completely because you do want to support the good journalism that is happening and publishers who are seeking out the whole truth so that it's not just going to the people who are spouting fake news but yeah it's an individual strategy that you have to sort of come up with for your yeah, agency thanks. i think if you have a lot of clients advertising clients and then if you're in-house then specifically for your brand like where do we want these to show up like you were saying with the youtube example yeah i mean look it, it, so from a purely conversion point of view if, you're, if there's a you know a cnn or a cbs article so a very reputable site about i don't know some horrible serial killer I highly doubt people are going to be like, oh, look at the side banner over here to buy a stroller. Yes. Well, you, you would think that but there's a chance that they're being retargeted from something that they <laughs> looked at previously. So I just snorted. So funny that was. Okay. <laughs> Moving on to article number two. Great pivot. Really seamless. Article number two. From Google's own blog, learn more about the person behind the news article. Google is committed to helping people access timely, authoritative news and information from a variety of different sources, as well as investing to help sustain a quality news ecosystem. Now, Google is rolling out a beta feature in search to help people learn more about an individual journalist or author by more prominently highlighting their recent work. Basically, what you have is a knowledge panel for the author, as opposed to just showing you an overview with some people also search for people or, or other related search items, you get a carousel of their articles so you can understand, hey, these are the actual articles this person wrote. This is what this author is all about from an actual content perspective. It's really interesting. It's really cool. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are, Carolyn. Yeah, so this is actually really interesting because uh, this came out during SMX Advance, this news, and it was literally, I feel like it was a couple hours after Barry uh, Schwartz and Lily Ray had this, not intense, but this back and forth about um, whether an author profile is important for EAT. And I think Lily was really emphasizing the importance of it. I don't think Barry was saying it wasn't important at all, but um, that was, <laughs> it was one like of the Barry, moments. By the way, like, about everything. Yeah, Barry, Barry's like, nothing's ever important. It's fine. Just like do cool stuff. It's okay. Um, anyway, but yeah, so uh, then this information came out and I remember messaging Barry in Slack and being like, so maybe Lily was right after all. And he was like, maybe. So <laughs> this is specifically for journalists. And uh, yeah, like you were saying, it's supposed to highlight the, the good work that they're doing in publishing. And I also think it, I mean, I don't have confirmation, but it seems sort of related to the work that Google is doing, even in other countries regarding publishing, making deals to ensure that uh, publishers are paid for their work, the showcase that they're doing uh, in other countries and things like that. So I think it's one of their other steps, to, maybe in goodwill even, to help sort of bring reputable journalists to the forefront and highlight the work that they're doing and the, their background, like their history background. Like this person has been working in journalism for a long time. They're a reputable source. Here are the stories that they've been working on. Here's their beat or something like that. So I think there are lots yeah. of factors up here. 
It's really, really, I know, for example, I know Mark Trapagan posted on Twitter that he saw all of a sudden he was able to claim a knowledge panel and it had those that, that carousel of articles there, which makes a lot of sense. He writes a ton. I'm curious yeah. though, how this plays out. It, you would have to imagine Google has said they've done this why Lily's saying write the, write the bios, that Google's profiling authors saying, okay, this author writes about this. Like, Mark writes about um, keyword research and, and content marketing, content strategy. But let's say as time goes on, the author starts to pivot away. Let's say, for example, in this case, Mark starts writing about social media strategy. How does that impact? Does it impact? Will it impact? I have no idea. I'm just theorizing here. But how will that impact how Google looks at that author? Will Google understand the author's pivoting? Will it can, will that dilute the author's authority or overall? Or will it lend credence to the new topic that the author's writing about? I mean, it seems like once you reach a critical mass of articles around a topic, you will become an expert in that topic. Um, and I perhaps there may be some like overall dilution of if you were writing about something really specific beforehand. But I think if you zoom out a little bit, there's still an overarching topic. Like we're talking about content marketing, whether it exists on a website or on a social media platform, that sort of thing, which I'm hoping with, you know, all of the AI and machine learning that Google announced at like IO and things like that and um, Google Marketing Live, that they will sort of get the picture that that's what's happening overall yeah and also it's a it's just it's sort of like a beta that's rolling out in some places so there's also the chance that they take it away because sometimes the US, google just, right? i believe so google there's google always rolls things out and then right. i mean not always but i don't know a large percentage of the time it feels like google will roll things out and then be like okay never mind <laughs> we, that's not how we <laughs> wanted it to work or things like I that. Know, I with the feeling that this one just kind of makes sense. It feels like it, it it aligns to what they're doing in general. It aligns to what they've been doing for years with the knowledge graph. So why why not? But yeah, you're right. They could totally roll this back. But now you know every SEO in the world is like, okay, now you need to hire uh, or you need to have a a writer who has this knowledge panel show up so that it'll boost your own authority on your own website. You know that's what's that's the next that's the next tip at whatever conference or whatever webinar anybody is doing. Great. But really, journalists out there, please use this as a bargaining chip in your negotiations for higher pay at your, <laughs> at your next news organization job. So you can say, look, I've got this news panel. I can drive more traffic to your site when people are searching for XYZ. I am good for your SEO. Yes. Right. Do you know what make else make is good? <laughs> you know what else is good for your SEO? FAQs in a rich result full of FAQs, endless expandable FAQ tabs that just go on and on. Oh no, those are gone. From search engine land and Barry Schwartz, Google limits FAQ rich results to a maximum of two per snippet. Google has confirmed that it made a change to show a maximum of two FAQ rich results or rich expandable cards per result in search results. Previously, Google would show several FAQ rich results, but over the past couple of days, SEOs began to notice Google limiting them to just two. You could read about it in Barry's article. By the way, who lets Barry write this crap? <laughs> I guess I'm me, just kidding. I'm just <laughs> kidding. I'm just kidding. I am so happy about this. There are I so many, I know, like, yeah, it's unbelievable. Have you seen them? There's like ones with like, Show more tabs, and this is hundreds. Brody <laughs> Clark has so many examples on his on his blog of FAQ rich results, blah blah blah. And there's just like this huge mammoth thing. Kayak is the worst or best at this, depending how you look at it. They're there, every single one of their pages has tons of questions that they put in the FAQ markup, and they just dominate mm -hmm. the entire cert with this, I would say relatively meaningless or not entirely helpful to be more politically correct, series of expandable cards, but now you get two bitches, that's it. Morty. <laughs> I feel like a long time ago in the SEO community, people decided that the uh, FAQ schema was useless anyway. And so I feel like maybe it was just a conversation we were having, but it, I feel like a lot of people were like, eh, it's, you know, there's not a ton of benefit in having this schema in there. It sounds like Kayak was somehow doing it really well, but yeah. Uh, having yeah. endless amount of FAQ 
seems pointless, especially from a user experience point of view, which I think is where Google is going with a lot of things. They want people to have a good experience in search results and having endless FAQ is not, is not it. <laughs> no, it's basically it's like, here, let me make my result as big as freaking possible so that I will push off my competitors off the SERP, literally. Great. Yeah. That's really helpful to people because it would be really great now if Google did a quality update around this stuff because some of those FAQs, okay, now you only have two, which is great, but some of them are completely irrelevant to what you're actually searching for to the page. I wouldn't say completely irrelevant. They're relevant enough where, yeah, I can see why Google would show this, but you know why the people are just are doing it just to make the result look bigger, great. It's not really helpful. Yeah, it's not like actual it. questions people would have, like users okay. would have. No, it, it's, there's FAQ markup, Google thinks, all right, might, we might as well show it because these are FAQs. People are frequently, at, it says the F is for frequent. So let's put <laughs> yes. it there. But you know, the yeah, F there's a, I, it feels like that thing that uh, I feel like Barry also always harps on this is that Google gives SEO something and then they take advantage of it. Uh, and so this might be one of the cases where we were like, let's answer every single question we could ever think of about a certain topic on every single page and hope on that every it single page on the home page. Yeah. What's on the home page? Unbelievable. Yeah. It needs to be more specific. Well, I'm glad so Google gave a spanking. Is the idea that um, you could put multiple questions on your page, but Google will just pick the top two, two. or the two most relevant? I I don't know if it's the first two. Like I, I have one on my podcast website, um, the SEO rant. Check that out. <laughs> Free plug. I'm here. Um, and it, I noticed it only it started only pull two. I think it just pulled the first two. But mm. I don't know if that's across so, the board or not. I'm saying that completely anecdotally. Okay. But one would so, think that the first two questions are the most important ones. Well, yeah, hopefully. So if you're doing your strategy around this, make sure that you're first two questions are the ones that you actually want people to see if that's how it's being pulled right and make sure you have two on every single one of your pages no matter relevant or not just make sure there's two yeah i don't know that that's great advice but i make sure they're at least relevant <laughs> at least make sure they're relevant you know what's yeah. also really relevant we're proud to have site strategics as our sponsor of edge of the web that was not really relevant but hey it sounded good Site strategics are pioneers in agile digital marketing. Their core specialties are technical SEO, including core web vitals, SEM, social media, conversion optimization, results-based marketing that works. They also have developed a unique omni-channel. That's a big word. An omni-channel media marketing and content curation process guided by their weekly R&D from the edge of the web interviews they incorporate the best techniques for content broadcast strategy and execution if you are interested in what they can do for you give them a call at 877-SEO4WEB that's 877-736-4932 just tell them that Morty sent you on to article number four how could I just we not to talk about interrupt for a second and say that good for you for getting that phone number right? Because as I was reading it in my head, I mixed up the numbers and I was like, oh, thank goodness I am not reading this one out loud. I, I have to, by the way, because I make fun of Aaron that he gets his own phone number wrong in every single episode. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like now I feel like I have to, it's the one thing I have to get right in the show. Nice. And it's probably the only thing I have gotten right on this show so far is the phone <laughs> number. <laughs> this this will be the last time I sit in the captain's chair. Article number four, or as the slide I'm reading says, news article number four from Barry Schwartz's. Yes, two Barrys. Every episode must contain at least two articles from Barry and one from somebody else. From Search Engine Roundtable, Google's page experience update rolling out between June 15th and end of August. Last week, Google not only said that the June 2021 core update finished rolling out on June 12th, but it also said that on June 15th, just to keep you on your toes, 
it began rolling out the slow process of rolling out the page experience update. Great. Now you don't know if you're impacted by the core uh, the core update or if you're impacted by the page experience update. Thanks, Google. Um, reminder, this was supposed to be rolled out in May, but it was delayed for undisclosed reasons. Undisclosed reasons. They don't know what they don't know how it's going to impact things yet. It's it's so flowing and dynamic. You have websites that don't have traffic that don't have these core web vitals. Then they're going to be in tiebreaker situations with sites that do have traffic. How is it going to work out? How is it all going to fall out? Google is I, my personal opinion is rolling this out very slowly because it hasn't exactly figured out how to best handle all of these questions that are still left in the air. And it's one, hey, let's just roll this thing out. Let's impact everything. Well, not everything. Let's impact rankings to the fullest extent that the page experience update could and deal with the fallout later. It makes more sense to see how this goes slowly because I personally think they don't quite have it all figured out yet because it's a fluid situation. But that's just me. Let's hear what Carolyn Lyon has to say. Yeah, well, I just want to add to that that so they so they rolled out the June core update. Um, and they confirmed that I think it ended around June 12th. Oh yeah, British rolling out June 12th, like you said. And then uh, the page experience update is in the process of rolling out through August. And then they also confirmed that there's going to be a July core right. algorithm update too. So um, I think it will be hard for a lot of people to determine what is going on with our rankings if they're fluctuating and what is the actual cause for it. I think a it seems like a lot of SEOs, though, believe that the page experience update and specifically Core Web Vitals are not going to be a huge thing that caused fluctuation in rankings. Unless, I guess, you're in a really, really competitive space where the quality of your content is very equal to that of your top competitors, and then maybe Core Web Vitals will be imperative to your rankings. But then again, uh, if you saw great fluctuation up or down in the June update, there's a potential for it to go the opposite. And I believe, I don't remember who exactly, somebody from Google essentially said that. There's the chance that it will do the opposite when the July update rolls out. So, um, good. I, yeah, I think the problem, SEOs always want to pinpoint what happened because we were like, if we know exactly what algorithm update it is, then we could use all the data that we have to determine what's wrong with our sites. And I think I think the idea is that like the foundation of SEO is the same across the board and it has been even through all the algorithm and ranking changes. So like if we're just doing the foundations correctly, then then we wouldn't have these big huge changes. And if we did, we could fix them very easily with user data really. That's my opinion. Yeah. I agree with that for the most part. I think there's sometimes there are splits where you have a core update that maybe doesn't want, maybe has refined its ability to to show highly relevant content. So this ultimate guide that you wrote, the user has got to scroll five times to get to that one part is out and a specific page just about that one specific subtopic is in. So knowing that is really helpful. But again, it's just a matter of analyzing what happened on your particular SERPs and seeing Okay, did your competitors go up? Did you go down? What are your competitors doing? What's happening with them? And if it, it is Core Web Vitals, you can check that. It's all public information. It's not like you can't figure that out. Your competitors yeah. have great Core Web Vitals. Your content is both the same. Your Core Web Vitals suck. Well, that's yeah. probably what it is. I feel like too many it's people spend... Science. Well, too many people spend all their time in the tools and think like the tools are going to tell me the secret to, you know, ranking or content or whatever it is. And not enough people actually just go into the search results and be like, who's ranking above me now? What does their content have that mine doesn't? What questions does it answer that mine doesn't that could, you know, help the user along in their journey? And I think that, like you were saying, go to the search results and actually look at what's going on there. And then you can pull the data from the tools to support that. Correct. The, the tools should help you maybe find the right keywords to focus on. Like maybe tell you, okay, how are things moving on the SERP? What's happening? What's the story here and from a very top level view and point you in the direction of where should you start looking? But you can't, yeah. like, there's nothing that's going to stop you from no, nothing, rephrase that. There's nothing that's going to help you other than using your own brain and looking what's actually yeah. out there. Yeah. That's why they uh, pay us the big bucks in SEO, right? Yeah. 
for my brain. Not for my good looks, that's for sure. On to SEO chat. Holy, holy crap, B both people who run SEO chat are here on <gasps> edge of the web. <gasps> wow, that's like worlds colliding. Worlds are colliding. I mean, saying that I help run it is very generous because ever since I had a baby, Morty, Morty has been doing a great job of essentially taking over. So I don't want to take the credit for doing, like booking all the people and being, getting all the topics and doing all the promo. I just exist on SEO chat, I so. I'm just anal about like having like a schedule for like the next two months. <laughs> like I, I appreciate I, I, it. Thank you for doing yeah. all the hard work. No, no, no. I don't do all the hard work. You definitely help out with all the hard work. So it's a joint effort. So I will not take all of that praise because I don't do well with praise. Um, also, okay. this week is hosted by Abby Reimer. We're talking about content ideas, where to get your content ideas, how to leverage tools, how to leverage your brain, how to leverage everything to find content ideas. Where do you find your content ideas? Check out my tweet. That was a little bit edgy. Anyway, um, SEO chat happens 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time this Thursday. Be there. Jacob, are you going to be there? I'm not. What the? I have a, I have a meeting. I have a meeting. A uh, meeting with what? Uh, or maybe it's next week. I don't know. I got to look at my calendar. Yeah, maybe it's next oh, week. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm out of town. <laughs> I don't even know what's Hello, going on. Hello, Twitter. We, Twitter is not just in Indianapolis. Buddy. We record this on Monday. I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> we record this on Monday. <laughs> I will just say for the record that I really love Abby, and I've had a couple of phone calls with her, and her content generation ideas are next level. And she's even given me ideas of places to get content and source information for content and make sure that you know, what we were talking about before, you're really serving all the users. So I are the needs of your users and your target audience. So I think it's one that you, the audience, you will not want to miss. I love Abby. She's awesome and amazing. Most definitely. I just had her on the SEO Ramp podcast. Aaron's going to kill me if I keep promoting myself. Um, <laughs> that was a great episode. We're talking about copycat content. She is, again, one of the few people actually using her brain to go look at content, see what's going on, see what the problems are, mm -hmm. and then make an analysis afterwards. Um, by the way, Aaron, if you're listening, and Jacob, it's okay that I plug my, the SEO rant twice because I'm not plugging Open Mic SEO and Clubhouse this week because I'm not doing it. So I get a free one. There you go. Free you even, it's like you didn't even say that right there. Yeah. Um, open Mic SEO usually happens on Clubhouse on Wednesdays at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Just, you know, throw that in there. Whole, anything else I need to promote? No. Okay. That's it for Edge News this week. Check out Bill Slosky's interview segments. Uh, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel to get up-to-date information when we go live with our next show. Thank you so much, Carolyn, for coming on. Just for me, an honor and a ton of fun. Probably a pain in the neck for you, but thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Thanks for having me. I'm always happy to chat with Morty. And to be frank, I'm kind of disappointed we didn't have any conversation about football, which is usually how we start oh, these. Uh, can we talk? Can, is it too late to talk about Julio Jones going to the Titans and the fact that the Steelers have an 85 year old quarterback whose just knees are disintegrated? <laughs> uh, 85 is aggressive, but uh, yeah, we can. He moves? I mean, My grandfather moves better than him. The saddest part, in my opinion, about Julio is that he wanted to leave. He didn't want to stay with us. Uh, yeah, Atlanta talks about the hashtag brotherhood, but all these brotherhood people always leave us. <laughs> but you still have Matt Ryan. You got on, um, what's his name? The number three pick, number four pick, the the tight end of all tight ends. I can't remember his name. It's oh, crazy. I can't either for the... I don't know. I feel like... But he's supposed to be amazing. <laughs> sure. Well, wow. the problem is that we always get offense. We never get any... Uh, We'll see. We'll see how this year goes. Every year we're like, it's a building year. We can't build forever. <laughs> well, you could. You could be the Jets. Anyway, um, <laughs> I always got to take a quick. I'm from New York, which is I always got to take a quick shot at the Jets. Um, from all of us over at Edge, stay safe, stay well, and don't be a piece of cyber driftwood. <laughs>